Hola, hola. Hola, a todos. hola buenas tardes a todos. Eh, volvemos después de nuestro break. Espero que hayan descansado, hayan comido, hayan, hayan juntado fuerzas. Eh, volvemos a, a, nuestra, a nuestro ciclo de charlas, a nuestro TechConnect 2020. Eh, la mañana, bueno, la mañana tuvimos un, una gran jornada eh, donde aprendimos principalmente de cómo se estaba eh, ejecutando algunos proyectos principalmente eh, orientados a la inter interoperabilidad transfronteriza. Son dos palabras que cuesta pronunciarlas y juntas peor. Eh, eh, en, este, en, este, en este segundo ciclo del tercer día, o el segundo bloque del tercer día, eh, vamos a comenzar la tarde con nuestro gran amigo James Agnew, eh, que ya en la mañana nos eh, dio eh, dos charlas muy, muy buenas, que eh, espero la hayan aprovechado. Eh, les eh, insisto que estarán con ayuda de un traductor, entonces para que puedan seguir las charlas y puedan invitar a las personas que de alguna forma eh, tienen eh, problemas o no, o, no, o no pueden seguir el inglés tan fluidamente, tendremos traducción online. Eh, mil perdón por un auto que está sonando aquí afuera que lleva como 30 minutos. <risa> Entonces, son cosas, de, son cosas del... No es el mío, pero son cosas de la conexión online. He hecho todo para poder sacarlo de ahí, pero no, no tengo... Y no, y no me lo robé yo. <risa> eh, bueno, partimos el, el, el ciclo de la tarde, con, como les comentaba, con nuestro amigo James eh, Agnew quien nos dará, eh, y, y, y es una charla muy atingente porque eh, dado que James estuvo en la mañana eh, hablándonos a, acerca de seguridad, acerca de eh, cómo se complementaba con Smart on Fire eh, y la, lo fácil que es eh, hacer el plug and play, entre comillas, eh, eh, salieron muchas dudas acerca de los servidores. O sea, ahí hubo, hubo, de hecho, Jorge, Jorge estuvo y nuestro equipo de operaciones estuvo contestando, contestando preguntas acerca de servidores FIRE. Eh, y justamente la charla de ahora eh, se denomina servidores FIRE. Eh, y el objetivo de la charla principalmente es describir las funcionalidades de un servidor FIRE. Así que eh, esta charla viene muy, muy eh, como anillo al dedo a las personas que están interesadas en conocer eh, los proyectos, cómo pueden adaptar su, y configurar un servidor FIRE. Eh, así que dejamos a James eh, con la presentación, la primera presentación. Eh, bienvenido, James, a la jornada de la tarde y muchas gracias por acompañarnos. All right. Muchas gracias. Let's share this. Sergio, I hope your car will still be there after uh, after this is all done. <laughs> okay, so, well, first off, thank you all for uh, listening to my voice for such a long time today. Uh, I really, uh, really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to address this event. So hopefully, this will be uh, will be interesting to everyone here. Um, as, as always, uh, here is a, yet again, the link to download. I did, uh, of course, I really dropped the ball today. I realized after the second talk that I'd given you the link, but I hadn't opened the link. So of course, anyone that tried to use it, um, had to ask for permission to actually access the link. So I have fixed that as well. Um, so now anyone who wants to, uh, access this link, go right ahead. Um, and I will put this up once more at the end as well. So we've spoken, uh, as, as Sergio was saying, uh, we spoke a bunch about topics like security and sort of innovation on fire and all of that exciting stuff. Um, one of the things that I think is really most exciting these days in the world of fire is just the scale of implementations. Um, in the early days of fire, of course, <clears throat> most, of the, most of the implementations we could point to that we're doing things successfully, we're doing things at a relatively small scale. 
But one of the things that's really changed in the last year or two has been that we've started to see some really big deployments of fire. Um, people building national EHRs, people building big enterprise systems, large hospital corporations putting all of their records into fire systems. And that type of problem, as we all know as software developers, doing something at a small scale is, is just a completely different type of problem from doing things at a large scale. So what I want to talk to you about today for, uh, for my final talk is just a few ideas around building server architectures that that will sort of meet your production scaling needs and sort of just generally how to how to build a production ready fire server as you start to plan that type of thing out. So that's that's our rough agenda today. I'm going to jump through a bunch of related but fairly different topics and hopefully this will give you some ideas uh, as you start to think about how you can do your own deployments. So the very first thing to talk about, of course, if you want to build a scalable system is to figure out what you mean by big, because there are all kinds of definitions and naturally big is a, a, a relative term. Um, on the small end of big, um, you know, I've seen people that say, I need to build a really big system because it has to store a thousand patients in it. And I, I think to anyone who's ever built a, a scalable, a, bit, a really big scale system storing a thousand of anything, there's, there is no definition where that's big. But then you get into, you know, are we building a fire repository that has to hold all of the patients in a city, whether that city is 10,000 or a million or 10 million people, um, that is potentially a, you know, that's getting bigger. Maybe you're trying to store all of the patients for a state or a country. That, that certainly, those are, those are even bigger scales. Um, maybe the type of data that you're storing just completely changes the nature of it. Uh, I always love using the example of continuous glucose monitor device data, uh, also called in English at least CGM data. Um, those, these devices are taking glucose readings from someone who's wearing that device oftentimes every 10 seconds or once a minute or something like that. Um, other examples of that might be things like fitness, Fitbits or wearable data where it's measuring your step count and your heart rate every few seconds. As soon as you've got a, a device that's taking a measurement every couple of seconds, you have got tons of data every day being recorded. Uh, and then if you try and scale that out to an entire population of patients, you've got a whole other order of magnitude more data. So figuring out how big is big to you, of course, is a really hard question to answer, but certainly starting there always does make sense as you try and plan out your, your architecture. Um, kind of a related thing that I, I don't mention here, but is also worth thinking about is how long do you need to store data for? Uh, this is often a, a, a difficult problem as well. You know, if you're building a fire repository whose aim is to contain copies of data that lives in other places, you probably don't need to store that data forever. On the other hand, if you're building a fire repository that's going to be the source of truth, the only place where data ends up for your organization or your system, then you probably need very long retention policies and you're going to have to figure out an architecture that either keeps data around for a long time or maybe archives it but doesn't delete it after a while, all kinds of considerations around uh, how you manage that kind of problem. So some architectures we might use to build this kind of thing. Um, the first and frankly still most common approach to building large architectures is just to build a really big database. Long, a long time ago, sort of trying to scale out, up a relational database was a challenge. These days, there are many database technologies that you can scale horizontally and vertically and really without having to build a terribly complex architecture, get a fair bit of scale out of it. Um, technologies like Postgres, like Oracle, um, are, are pretty good at storing oftentimes terabytes of data in a single large pool. You'll be limited, of course, by just raw amount of disk space you can throw at the problem, but they are good at spreading themselves across pools of disks and things like that. So you can often, you can often get quite a bit of scale by building a single fire database that is, uh, is storing all of your data. The advantage, of course, of keeping everything in a single database is that as soon as you want to go and query your data, you've got a single place to look. 
Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how old your data is or what type of data you're looking for or anything like that. There's a single place you need to query. Uh, if you want to do joins so that you can include data from other, you know, you can you can perform the, the fire underscore include functions and that type of thing. Uh, it's always possible to do that if you've got a single great big repository. So lots of advantages to building just a single a single database that you're going to scale up that way. Uh, you know, the the advantage, of course, um, is that is that those pools do tend to work really well. I've got some numbers on the screen. Uh, these numbers are actually taken, uh, this is about a year old. They're probably uh, even bigger than this now, but this is taken from a, a real Happy Fire implementation, one of the larger Happy Fire implementations I've ever heard of. This is a big, uh, a big US hospital or a big clinic network in the US actually. And just to give you some numbers of, of in terms of what they've got stored, um, you know, as you can see, 1.2 million patients, 1.6 billion observations in a single fire database, uh, all kinds of other numbers there. Um, I, I don't list transaction volumes, but this single Happy Fire instance, um, in fact, it's a large cluster of Happy Fire instances with a single logical database, serves about 2,000 requests a second, which is, I mean, that that is massive, I think, by, uh, by anyone's scale. Certainly, it's rare in my life that I've uh, had to deal with systems that process uh, transactions at that type of volume, and to manage those 2,000 Fire transactions every second. I've given you a little sense of the number of CPU cores and the, the amount of disk storage that they had to put underneath their database pool to, uh, to store that. This is all on an Oracle rack cluster, incidentally, if you're wondering about the underlying database technology. Um, but I, I think similar uh, performance could be achieved with other relational databases as well. So, I, I mean, in terms of, of where we're going with this, certainly we have, uh, you know, we've, we've implemented support in Happy and Smile for a number of relational databases. We recently added support for MongoDB, um, with being our first uh, NoSQL implementation. We've added support for raw file system to store large binary files that you're not cluttering your relational database with, uh, with binary attachments and things like that. And there's a number of areas that we're hoping to go in the next few years. Um, coming up with other, other NoSQL options, certainly including uh, the Cassandra database seems like a logical one. We've spent a lot of time thinking about things like time series databases, um, InfluxDB being a great example of those. If you've never looked at InfluxDB and, uh, and time series databases like it, uh, they are amazing for, for storing data that is time series in nature. So my example at the start of continuous glucose monitoring data or Fitbit like wearable data, that, that type of data where you've basically got lots and lots of key value pairs where your key is the time, like a timestamp, and your value is some sort of device reading. Um, these, these time series databases, they're designed to do one thing and do that one thing very well, and that store this type of time series data efficiently and be able to query it efficiently. So we're really excited to start looking at, uh, at how we might sort of marry that concept with, uh, with the more broad concept of a fire server as well. Moving beyond just the the concept of a single a single logical database, it's worth mentioning that Fire fundamentally uses the principles of REST to 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 express its API, and REST is entirely dis designed around the idea of distributed architectures. So fundamentally, Fire, by virtue of those technolo te technology choices, does distribute itself very well. And certainly that means that it is absolutely possible for you to break your data into logical pools. Uh, and you might break that data into logical pools on all kinds of axes. I have seen people who have decided to do geographic splitting, where instead of having one great big repository, they will build one repository per city or one repository per hospital building or one repository per data modality. So for example, maybe patients in one and lab tests in another. Uh, th these types of architectures do work really well. And of course, really all you need to do to make that work is be sure that you're using absolute references in your resources. Um, so I've got examples of those down here. And of course, this is, this is the nice thing about, uh, about Fire, as I say, it's all REST, it's all using HTTP transport protocols. So if you've got a resource that refers to another resource and it does it with a complete, uh, a fully qualified URL, 
then you can always chain across those uh, those references. So that does tend to work uh, very well in terms of uh, in terms of sort of reaching across uh, from resource to resource. Certainly another, uh, another approach if you're trying to build a great big scalable uh, architecture is just to leave your data in place instead of even building a, a fire repository. This, uh, this approach, often called a facade, um, is an approach that you will often see uh, with organizations that have existing data stored in existing systems who want to adopt fire but don't want to, uh, you know, don't want to have to throw away all of their existing infrastructure or perhaps can't throw away all of their infrastructure. Uh, and certainly this approach is one I've seen, you know, predominantly in places like hospitals, uh, which do tend to have lots of existing systems. With a facade, naturally, you write a fire endpoint um, that is going to contain some sort of mapping code. And then that mapping code will talk to underlying data sources Generally speaking, those are databases, but they could be existing web services that aren't fire, or they could be any other source of data within your enterprise. And they will convert your queries into non-fire queries, get, get a response, and then convert that response back to fire, uh, and then ultimately respond back to clients. One of the questions that uh, for some reason I have found myself answering a lot in the last while is what is the performance of a fire facade? Um, I always find it strange that that's a, a question we keep getting just because the performance of a fire facade ultimately is almost entirely dependent on that bottom tier, you know, how quickly does your bottom tier respond to queries. And ultimately the, the facade itself adds almost no overhead to that in your typical use cases. So it really will come down to how quickly can your, your, underlying, uh, your underlying systems provide answers to, uh, to fire queries that have come in. One of the drawbacks to doing the facade approach uh, is that you are absolutely constrained by the abilities of the underlying data source. So what I mean by that is naturally a full, if you've got a, a fire repository that is you know, a, a native fire repository built as a fire repository to begin with, uh, for example, the Happy Fire or Smile CDR server, but certainly including any of the many other uh, fire servers that exist out there, those systems are designed to, to completely sort of support the entire fire specification. They support every search parameter, every include functionality, uh, joined terminology searches, all of that kind of good stuff will all be natively supported by the fire server. Uh, and it will tend to just work cleanly out of the box. On the other hand, if you're doing a facade, naturally you're, you're gonna have an existing data model and an existing database with its own schema that you're, you're talking to. And that existing schema is probably going to have it's going to have it, you know, it's going to have a set of database indexes that it supplies, and it's going to have lots of columns that don't have indexes. And of course, you're not going to be able to support search parameters on a column that doesn't have an index already. So you are constrained by what your uh, your underlying data supports. That's the drawback to doing a facade, but the great big advantage, of course, is you don't have any kind of synchronization issues. Naturally, if you've got a source of truth that isn't your fire repository, but you're copying data into your fire repository, you end up with source of truth problems where you're not, you're never, you know, you always have to at least question, is the data that I'm receiving from my refi fire repository completely up to date? So that, uh, that, that, presents a uh, certainly an architectural challenge in terms of trying to, to design an architecture like this. One of the things that uh, we've been working on uh, pretty endlessly across the HAPPY project in the last while is designing what we're calling this concept of a native fire gateway. Uh, the idea with a native fire gateway is that you could take a pool of fire endpoints, whether those fire endpoints are individual fire repositories or individual fire facades, and then have a, a gateway sit on top of them that aggregates uh, data from each of them and presents it as a single fire endpoint for your fire for the clients that are trying to speak to it. Uh, this isn't a feature that we've got yet, but it's one that we've been uh, we've been thinking about quite a bit, and we're starting to get into the design phases, trying to to plan out a build for this, just because we are certainly recognizing that increasingly we're seeing organizations that have. 
lots like they'll have multiple fire servers that are all very mature and very useful but then they'll have fire clients that don't want to be talking to multiple fire servers they're not designed to work that way so we see a gateway that sits in between your fire endpoints and your apps as being a, a fairly vital piece of uh, of infrastructure in order to make that all work naturally the gateway is not a complicated thing. It's not terribly hard for someone just to build one of those themselves. And in fact, all it really is, is a facade that happens to sit on top of, of potentially other facades. But we're hoping to build some infrastructure that will make that a little bit easier to build. Once we've got a gateway that's built, um, obviously it will have the ability to route queries across those repositories, but we're figuring we will add things like in, like a, a unified security layer and the ability to do rapid caching of data within the gateway, things like that. So lots of plans to come uh, in this, this exciting feature that we like to call the Fire Gateway. Um, certainly a, a common architecture these days. I was talking this morning about Apple Health Records and the, the transformative effect that it has had. This, uh, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is this notion that in, in many cases, you actually don't even need to, to get a gateway on top of multiple endpoints. Your apps themselves can be the aggregators um, and they can handle talking to multiple different fire repositories. Uh, the, the Apple Health Records app works exactly like that. Um, this is, and I will say, we, I don't I don't have access to this app. It is a US only app at this point, um, but I think that's going to change over the next while. So we'll see Apple starting to launch this in other countries uh, as this technology starts to become more common. One of the interesting things though about this approach is that the phone in this case is the gateway. Uh, the phone is able to speak to, if I've connected it to five different hospitals, the phone will, will speak to all five hospitals and fetch the most recent copies of, of all of the data that's relevant. Uh, and it, it acts as a little aggregator that's pulling data in and, and displaying it to a patient. And hopefully in the future, helping users actually share that information. The aim being, of course, that if I go to a new doctor, potentially I could, uh, I could, I could share the data that I'd collected from previous doctors with this next doctor through my phone, which is a, just a fascinating sort of idea in terms of interoperability, I think. I certainly, uh, these days, I, I can't, I can't ever talk about scaling without talking about uh, the, the fire subscription feature. Um, I'm, I'm sort of joking a little bit and saying Fire subscription is awesome, and that's really all you should say. But if you haven't looked at Fire subscription yet, I would highly recommend taking a look at, at, at this feature of Fire. Subscription is what we call PubSub or Publish Subscribe, um, done natively in Fire. The idea that being that if you're building an application that wants to receive notifications anytime a piece of Fire data comes into your server, you've got the ability to subscribe to those changes using this fire subscription mechanism. And what you do on the other end, I've seen all kinds of fascinating use cases already. Um, use cases I've seen uh, include, for example, apps that are watching every patient showing up in an emergency department. Uh, in other words, these are subscriptions on encounters that, are, that have a location designated as an emergency department and are notifying um, some sort of coordinator anytime there's a spike in cases. So, yeah, I mean, you could imagine, and this year especially, this is interesting, you could imagine that this could be used as a really easy way of building software that detects outbreaks potentially before anyone notices because it's subscribed to five different hospitals. And if, if in one day we get, you know, 15 people showing up at each of the different emerge department, emergency departments with salmonella poisoning or COVID-19 for that matter. Um, we might know that there is a new outbreak going on uh, and that's difficult to, difficult to build a system like that normally. But if you've, got, if you've got fire repositories and you've got some subscription capabilities, it all of a sudden becomes very easy to build a system like that. Uh, and I have, I have actually seen organizations doing that at this point. Other, other use cases certainly include things like phone apps that need to notify you as soon as a lab test comes in or as soon as, uh, I don't know, as soon as an x-ray report comes in or something like that. 
And I think over the next few years, as subscriptions become more popular still, I think we will start to see all kinds of new use cases uh, that we haven't even thought of. This is one of those features that once app developers discover, discover it, they love it, and they start going crazy with ideas for it. Uh, and I, I just, I think it's fascinating. I absolutely love the Fire subscription capabilities. One of the things that we have uh, worked on a fair bit in the last while is beefing up support for subscriptions. These days, they can be uh, powered by Apache ActiveMQ or Apache Kafka. Uh, I think most developers now have heard of Kafka, especially it is a uh, a really popular enterprise messaging system. Uh, it sort of handles message queuing and delivery and stuff like that. Uh, and certainly within uh, our Smile CDR product, it's, it is a back end for subscriptions, meaning that you've got some excellent capabilities to, to guarantee delivery and very broad scaling of subscriptions, uh, even in, in very large systems. Worth mentioning as well, uh, one of the things we're working on is mechanisms for adding subscription capabilities to facades. Um, all of our subscription capabilities today are entirely reliant on the underlying Fire repository. But we often have people ask, what if I'm doing a facade? How do I do subscriptions then? So that is a thing we're trying to figure out. How could we add, uh, how could we add subscriptions to that, uh, that mechanism as well? I will mention uh, quickly one thing that we've started to talk about a fair bit is how do we build dashboards on top of Fire repositories. This is another, another topic that is becoming more and more prevalent as these Fire repositories become popular. The use case is, is really as follows. Uh, we've seen lots of hospitals specifically. Uh, this isn't limited to hospitals, but hospitals are a common use case. A hospital would, will decide to implement a Fire repository, and often they do it for a single app. They've got one use case they want to solve, and they figure, let's try solving that use case using Fire. So they'll create a Fire repository within their walls. They will make copies of all of their EHR data into the Fire repository. Uh, they'll have maybe the app will even collect some data itself, and they'll figure out what to do about that. And then they start scaling out from there. They'll add other apps to the Fire repository. And before they know it, they've got this whole network of apps that are collect that are that are working against this Fire repository. And all of a sudden, they've got this amazing enterprise asset that is this Fire repository with all of their patient data sitting inside it, all available as Fire. Now, one of the first things they might do then is start playing with subscriptions, because of course now they've got an easy enterprise pub sub, pub sub mechanism for all that data. But another thing they might want to start doing is doing reporting against that database. And I guess, um, you know, what I will say there is one of the big challenges with Fire is all of its APIs and all of its sort of mechanisms for querying. And for that matter, many of the database models uh, that are underpin Fire servers are designed for online transactional systems. They're designed for actual treatment systems and that kind of thing to be able to work efficiently. And a database design that's good for online transactional processing is often the exact opposite of a database design that's good for reporting. Um, so building dashboards and, and figuring out your key performance indicators, your KPIs, uh, can be really challenging at scale against your built-in database, uh, your, your built-in Fire database. So we've started working uh, on these features called app accelerators, which are effectively mechanisms for creating copies of all of your Fire data in a different schema that is normalized in order to be able to do um, rapid mining of data by... Uh, by visualization software. And I guess uh, anyone who's ever worked with software like uh, Power BI or Tableau or Crystal Reports for that matter, any of these great, any of these very popular reporting softwares will certainly be very used to the idea of needing, uh, needing specialized data lakes that are designed for reporting. So these app accelerator features are all about, about sort of creating copies of your fire data in a normalized form that's uh, in rather a denormalized form actually that's uh, that's that's intended for reporting. Um, I'll skip the discussion on the architecture for that. So, final topic uh, while we're talking about uh, about about uh, servers, and I've only got a couple of minutes left, is is around sort of building out security architectures at scale. Because naturally, as I said this morning, if 
you're trying to design a, a, a an architecture, oftentimes your data, like figuring out your data is not the hardest part. Security is actually one of the hardest things to do here. So, you know, thinking about this in, in general context, the health records app, the app, Apple health records app, they've solved really the easiest possible case, which is one patient, one user. When I authenticate to the health records app, I authenticate for myself. And that's and the only data I see in the app is my own data. There is no capability within that app for me to authorize myself to see my child's data or a parent I want to take care of or anything like that. Uh, there's all there's all kinds of uh, of confusing things that that will present wrinkles as you try and build these systems that uh, that scale out that way, and I, I'm not saying I necessarily even have solutions to that. I just I'm I'm highlighting that this is a challenge that people are are having a lot of trouble with and are are sort of working through as they try and plan out uh, scalable security. This um, this point is something I have been uh, I've been making for years. Uh, I I've been involved a number of times in my life in building sort of big national EHR projects. And I will say, as you build out a national or a statewide or a provincial or even a citywide EHR, where you've got data that comes from lots of systems, lots of organizations, um, dealing with your data models, the stuff that FHIR handles is, is really, it's, it's the easy part. Identification is usually is really that it's often the hardest part of this entire thing. The idea that, you know, system A is going to call a patient one, they're going to have a patient record one, two, three, and system B is going to have a patient record four, five, six, and those two records correspond to the same person. Um, dealing with that type of cross identification is a massive challenge at scale. Uh, in, and certainly this is a challenge that we see everywhere we go. It uh, has, as you guys plan this out in Chile, I think it'll be interesting to see to what extent this is a challenge for you. I do certainly know that you guys have your root number that can serve at least as a semi-reliable identifier for, for people and that many of your patients, probably most of your patients will have a root number. Uh, I don't know to what extent that gets collected by point of care systems. So who knows if it would be a reliable identifier for that type of cross identification, but certainly you've got an advantage that many places don't have in that you've at least got this existence of, of a reliable identifier. I will say that uh, in places like Canada, like the US, like many of the, uh, the Asian countries I've worked with, uh, India being another example of a place I've uh, spent a bunch of time talking to implementers, there is no concept of a reliable national identifier. So that type of any of these places, uh, they don't even have that kind of head start. Certainly it's worth mentioning, there are systems called master patient index systems uh, or MPIs, sometimes called EMPI systems uh, that are, the entire purpose of a system like that is to automatically create cross references. And they do that by comparing demographics and trying to suggest that records that look similar actually are similar. We have an open source implementation of, EM, of MPI functionality within Happy Fire. We launched that earlier this year, actually. Uh, so to anyone who's trying to solve this specific problem and is interested in playing with uh, with EMPIs, certainly I would recommend having a look at the Happy Fire EMPI. Uh, and I will mention, uh, we have a new release of Happy Fire uh, a week from, I guess, tomorrow. And there's a whole bunch of new features going into the EMPI module in Happy Fire as of next week. So keep, uh, keep posted for, for updates on that specific problem. Oh, that was my last slide. Excellent. So here's a few coordinates for where to find me. And I think that works out well. I know we've got a, uh, a few minutes left for questions. So if there are questions, I would absolutely be delighted to take them. Uh, either way, thank you guys very much for listening to, how, to all of my talking today. Very much appreciated. Here's where you can find me. Muchas gracias, James. Aplausos ¿Cuál suena? Virtuales. Sí, no, sí suena. Que suene, que suene. Eh, de verdad te agradecemos eh, haber estado con nosotros durante todo el día. Yo creo que han sido muy ilustradoras las charlas. Eh, muchas personas que están eh, comenzando el camino eh, en Chile. La, eh, la estructura de las charlas fueron hacia, hacia las preguntas que están recurrentemente en los chats y nosotros estamos...
mira, hay un montón de personas conectadas escuchando tu charla. Eh, a mí me hubiese gustado que hubiese estado mucha más gente porque son las preguntas recurrentes que nosotros contestamos desde Sense. Son las preguntas que, que la gente tiene, los implementadores están con ganas de empezar ya a probar cosas. Eh, entonces, te agradecemos mucho lo ilustrador de las charlas. Eh, abrimos, abrimos el espacio de preguntas. Eh, no hay ninguna pregunta hasta el momento. Ah, la pueden hacer en el idioma que prefieran. Yo aquí eh, estoy recibiendo. Por mientras llega, me, me tomo, el, me tomo el, el, el micrófono y si te puedo hacer algunas preguntas yo, James. Deja para cuestiones. Eh. Fernando también eh. quiere hacer preguntas. Fernando, Parece. perfecto. Mientras, aprovechemos mientras no llega ninguna escrita. Sí. Fernando, te doy la palabra. Buena, buenas tardes. Hola, saludos. Hello, James. Thanks. Excellent presentation. Many thanks. Uh, as you know, uh, IHE is another organization that uh, works a lot with interoperability uh, use case, and uh, it helps a lot with the industry. And as I was reviewing the past two, three years, IHE and FIRE are working each time more near between, between HL7 and um, FIRE and IHE. How you uh, you view this this join that each time you can we can view more profiles for example MH, MHD, PIXM, uh, SCM different profiles that are working between IHE and Fire. How you see this very powerful connection? Uh, uh, a view of that. Thank Absolutely. you. Jeff. Absolutely. Oh, I think that's an excellent question. Yeah, in, in the early days of FIRE, um, there was not much collaboration with IHE. And fortunately, that has really changed over the last few years. Um, you know, one, one example I will give, actually, I was, I was talking this morning about the, the WHO project, uh, doing those computable care guidelines. And that entire project is being run as what Fire, what HL7 and IHE are calling this thing called a Gemini project. Uh, and Gemini is actually specifically an initiative to improve collaboration between those two organizations by designing, um, designing projects that specifically allow the two organizations to each do what they do best um, and to sort of collaborate like that. So what do we mean by those two organizations doing what they do best? Um, ultimately, I think the idea there is that, you know, HL7 ultimately is a standards development organization. Their purpose is to write standards. Their purpose is not to certify standards. Their, their purpose isn't necessarily to, to, I mean, they have some mandate to do education, but it's not necessarily to, to do education. Uh, and it certainly is not to implement those standards. None of those things fall into the mandate of HL7. IHE, on the other hand, have a fairly different mandate. IHE are not standards developers, and they're very clear about that. They, their aim is not to author new standards, but their aim is to come up with mechanisms to use existing standards, and their aim is to certify that enterprises, that vendors, that organizations are using those standards and those profiles correctly. So, I mean, my, my personal opinion, and I guess this really isn't opinion, but the way I see those two organizations working is for those organizations to each play to their strengths. Meaning, you know, HL7 will keep working on FIRE, uh, IHE will, will create specs that are derived from FIRE, and ultimately, hopefully, we'll get to a point where IHE are testing organizations to allow them to demonstrate that they do correctly, they do correctly interpret that standard. Just because today, it is a common question we get in the FIRE community. People will say, I, I, I'm a vendor, I've got a product, how can you certify that I am correctly using your standard? And, and the, the answer today is you can't. There is nobody in the world that's willing to certify that you are fire conformant, um, which in the early days was nice, but is hard as you try and scale. So this is an obvious problem for IHE to solve. Thank you, James. Absolutely. Thank you, James. Um... Preguntas, chicos, aprovechen de hacer las preguntas. No hay preguntas hasta el momento. Se, 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 no se atemorizan. <risa>
aquí hay una pregunta. Eh, llegó una. Eh, la leo, eh, a ver, no la voy a traducir, tra eh, que el traductor me ayude porque la voy leyendo y la voy entendiendo para aprovechar el tiempo. En la misma línea de la pregunta anterior, James, ¿podrías darnos alguna referencia con, con respecto a Fire y perfiles IHE? Me gustaría cruzar estos conceptos contra, por ejemplo, lo que has dicho sobre Fire, MPI, eh, bases de datos distribuidas, por ejemplo. ¿Qué se ha hecho con eh, PIX o HDS? ¿Hay algún consejo que nos puedas dar en Chile? Se trató de implementar una ficha única compartida, lamentablemente eh, no resultó. All right. So I do, I mean, I certainly will have to admit, I am not an IHE expert, so I'm probably not the optimal person to even be answering this question because I'm sure there is work going on that I don't know about. But I mean, at least thinking about the examples that you've given here, um, you know, you mentioned two very popular IHE profiles, probably PIX PDQ and XD, XDS, uh, whatever it is, XDSI, I, I forget the specific one, but those are probably XDS. the XDS. XD, yeah, XDS. Those are clearly the most popular of the IHE profiles. There are many others, um, but those are, those are two of the most common ones. PIX, of course, um, there is now a PIX-M, um, and PIX-M, PIX-Mobile, is a fire profile that is aiming to solve all of the same problems as the traditional HL7 v2 version of PIX, but of course using fire. Uh, so that exists today. XDS, on the other hand, I'm not aware of anyone working on a fire um, a fire a fire equivalent XDS. And I guess if I think about it, I find that strange because I mean, ultimately, XDS is probably very aligned to the, the concept of a fire repository, but perhaps the architectural differences are, are important as well. I mean, XDS fundamentally works on this concept of having an index and then a distributed set of repositories for your documents. Fire, ultimately, I mean, this kind of comes to the heart of our, uh, our last talk. Um, Fire fundamentally often assumes a single repository that acts both as an index as well as the data that sits the actual repository. So it is kind of a different approach to XDS. Um, so I, I don't know actually how we end up uh, bridging those two gaps. Uh, one other profile I can mention just because I'm actively working on a project that's implementing this is the, the IHE ATNA profile, which I, ATNA, of course, to anyone who doesn't know IHE, is their auditing profile. Um, and there is a fascinating, probably the oldest collaboration of all between IHE and HL7 is that they decided very early on to share a single data model um, for, for audit events. And that data model is actually shared by IHE, ATNA, HL7's audit event resource, as well as the DICOM standard. They have all sta standardized on a single audit model, which is, is quite interesting, actually. So there are representations of that model in three different flavors for each of those uh, each of those uh, standards. I don't know that I've really answered your question, but those are the things I can think of. Gracias, James. Eh, pregunta, chicos. Eh, James, I have a, a question. Um, in relation with the scalability, the scalability Scalability uh, um, of Fire uh, Happy Happy Fire Server. Um, how how do you recommend the scalability when the 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 country is high distributed? Is highly distributed, uh, especially because the of sorry uh, and turn off the. Especially, especially <laughs> when the, the scalability is with focus to highly uh, uh, on high traffic of uh, transactions, transactions, especially in transactions for the patient, for billing, for inside and outside for the institution. What is the limit uh, uh, for? from happy to other solution. Right. Well, I guess, so, I mean, I will say, you know, a, a nice example. So I was, I gave that, uh, that example earlier 
uh, of that, that large database where they had millions of patients and billions of observations. And that, as I said, was all done in a single database. Uh, and theoretically, they could scale that much bigger in that same database. The, all of, the, all of the, the responses, like their response time is in the tens of milliseconds, even when they are doing 20,000 transactions a, a second or 20, sorry, 2,000 transactions a second. So they've achieved very good response time there. So that's that's good. But despite that, I mean, ultimately they have ended up deciding that they'd like to re-architect that system so that they're gonna, they're, they're gonna distribute it by, uh, by geographic region. Um, and the reason that they want to do that is that ultimately, and this is probably very similar to, to the situation you're describing. They realize that any user who's using the system probably really only cares about the patients who are in the same geographic region that they are. Uh, you know, thinking about the long, skinny country of Chile, I'm sure doctors in the north are very rarely looking at patients who are in the south. That seems uh, that would make sense. So, you know, coming up with a, you know, a regional, maybe a statewide distribution clearly makes a lot of sense. And then an idea that if you, you know, very rarely have a doctor in the North who wants to see a patient in the South for some reason, perhaps because the patient is traveling, they need, all they need to do is talk to a different fire server. Uh, and of course that's done across a network. Um, that type of thing makes a lot of sense. And the nice thing there is then you've got a bunch of smaller databases and Obviously, I mean, no matter what, it is just easier to administer a smaller database versus a large one. Um, you know, it means that you can, if, if, if ever you do have an outage, your whole system isn't down, just the one node of it is down. Uh, it means that you're not, you know, you're not trying to ma manage these massive, massive systems. There's lots of advantages to doing it that way. So I suppose that's probably a good answer to that. Okay, thank you for, for the answer. It's, 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 um, more questions, but sorry. Ma, ma pregunta. <ríe> eh, Pablo Almendra. Bien, Pablo. Me gusta esa, 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 mm. eh, esa propuesta. Aparte, está en, en periodo de formación. Así que está el Pablo, bueno, uno de nuestros ingenieros que, que ha apostado todo a Fire. Así que estamos muy contentos con él. En Chile. Eh, dice, en cuanto a arquitecturas con FIRE, ¿es común que organizaciones tengan más de un servidor FIRE o siempre se busca converger a un único servidor? Bueno, esto va un poco en la línea anterior que hablábamos en cuanto a la escalabilidad y la arquitectura. Si la, la arquitectura es más bien regional o más bien centralizada o más bien distribuida. Right. So I think the, you know, the, the, the short version of the answer to this is that today it is much more common for organizations to have a single fire server. And that's mostly because, I mean, especially in the early days, you didn't need more than one fire server, but the initial, like most of the initial apps and clients and that type of thing really didn't understand the concept of, of talking to multiple fire servers. So you were sort of limited by, by the capabilities of the, app, the apps that you were fundamentally trying to support. That is changing to now. Um, we are starting to see apps that do understand talking to multiple fire servers. We're starting to see people building scalable architectures that need to hit massive scale. And therefore they have good reason to try and uh, you know, to, to split data up into multiple servers. So really over the last year or two, we've started to see organizations rethink that architecture and look at, at distributed architectures. And I do think that's very much a good thing. So certainly, I, you know, as you, as you plan out what your next generation architecture looks like, I would absolutely say you'd want to consider a distributed architecture. It is, there are a lot of advantages to it. Okay, see we have you, one more. Thank you, James. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Carl Fisher. The, um, Carl Fisher. Uh, the question is about the, the interoperability with a uh, legate uh, system uh, versus the, the new develop. Uh, what is your opinion about the, the develop of uh, the, the new system with fire versus the legate system? Right. So this, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, the Happy Fire library that I maintain was designed initially a long time ago 
for exactly the uh, exactly the use case of being a facade on top of a legacy system that was not a native fire system. And of course, we built it because this was before there was even the concept of a native purpose-built fire system. Um, and I, I still think that's a great architecture. I mean, there are trade-offs, of course. You know, if you're trying to build a native fire system to sit next to your legacy fire system, then you've got duplicate data. You've got concerns about keeping that data in sync, in, you know, synchronized. You've got concerns around what if I update my fire data? How do I get those changes back into the original source of data? So there's, there's all kinds of challenges that you've got there, but it's also much easier to build that type of system because you're, you know, you're not, you're not sort of trying to worry about, uh, I don't know, about all these complicated real time data mappings and all that type of thing. So it is, it is absolutely a trade off. There are pluses and minuses to, to going with either architecture. And I don't know that I would say one is better than the other just that there are, there's always going to be considerations. Um, building the, the facade, I guess I'll say the facade is always the faster approach. I think the repository ultimately is, is the more powerful approach. Perfecto. Eh, creo que estamos con las preguntas. ¿Cómo estamos en el tiempo? ¿Estamos, eh, estamos OK? Mira, mantengámonos así para que, para que nos mantengamos bien el tiempo. Muchas gracias, James. Eh, thank you. Thank you, James, for your presentation and for all the, the, the knowledge that you share with us.